Well, good morning. All you who are gathered here and watching online, welcome to Life Church today. And I want to begin by asking a question, that is, what do I follow? I want to ask you, what do you follow? We follow all kinds of things, all kinds of things we, we follow with our lives. We follow the money. We follow power, glory, friends. We follow the rush, maybe our kids. <laughs> we follow our spouse. We follow trends or the government or retirement or social media. I don't know. What are you following with your life? Think about that today. I want to begin today by making a very audacious statement, and that is this. If you're following, first and foremost, anything other than Jesus Christ, you're following the wrong thing. And I'm not saying that because you should follow Jesus. I'm saying it because you have to follow Jesus. Only Jesus has the words of eternal life. If you follow anything else, you will be greatly disappointed. We start a new series today called The Marks of Following Jesus. We're going to talk about what it looks like to actually follow him. We're going to be asking some important questions in this series. What kind of questions do you ask yourself? You know, as people, we always ask ourselves all kinds of questions. Uh, we were born asking questions. Right, we drive our parents crazy, right? What, where, how, why, when, are we there yet? All the questions we ask. As we get older, we keep asking questions. Sometimes they're deep questions. We ask in pain, our moments of confusion. Sometimes they're questions of irritation, like in traffic. Why there's so many people on the road? Or why can't my kids just do what I say, right? Or why can't these Ikea instructions be more simple, right? What's the most important question you ever asked yourself? I'm going to suggest to you today there are three really important questions, and they all come up in the book of Mark, and that is this. Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus come? And how do we follow him? We're going to be going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the book of Mark, and we're going to be asking these questions. And they are important questions. And the one we're going to keep coming back to time and time again is that last one, how do we follow him? Based on who he is and why he came, how are we are going to follow him? For some of you, you don't know Jesus Christ very well, watching online or maybe gathered here, and you might say his name every once in a while when you stump your toe. Others of you might think you know him pretty well, but here's the question. Do you know about him or do you know him? And even if you do know him, here's the question. Are you following him? Are you following him? So if you don't mind, in the weeks and months to come, we're just going to talk about Jesus. Anybody have a problem with that? We, we, we have been through a terrible 12 months, <laughs> a global pandemic, social unrest, political tension, relational conflict, a historic winter storm. It's time for a reboot. Anybody agree with that? We need to reboot. And I know no better way to reboot than Jesus. So we're just going to talk about, is that okay we talk about Jesus? Is that all right? We're just going to talk about Jesus and we're going to learn who he is and why he came and how to follow him in this series. There are four Jesus stories recorded in the New Testament. They're called Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are not biographies. Uh, these actually and because of that, they're not, always, they're not always arranged chronologically. You see on the screen here behind me, you see uh, these four Gospels laid out for you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Next slide here. And people will say, oftentimes they'll say things like, 
hey, these gospels are inconsistent. Uh, they, they don't always line up and they tell different stories. And because of that, there are discrepancies. What people don't realize is they're not discrepancies because they're not pure biographies. They're actually theological histories. The authors have a certain reason they're writing the books. And based on why they're writing the books, they would tell stories a certain way. And so Matthew was written mainly to a Jewish audience. It's pretty religious. How do you worship the Messiah? Mark was written to a Roman audience. It's very practical. How do you follow him? That's what we're going to be here in the weeks to come. Luke was written to Greeks. It's very logical. You know, how do we really know Jesus and know the stuff's real? And John was written to Jews and Gentiles. It was more theological. How do you believe in this God? Now, those first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're, they're called the synoptic gospels. And that means they're the same, or the word means to see together. If you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're very common, very similar stories. Unlike John, that has 92% new content. John was written much later, gave new content. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written earlier. But even though Matthew appears first in the Bible, the first book written probably was the book of Mark. The Gospel of Mark was written around 55 to 60 A.D. And Matthew and Luke both pull from Mark to get some of their content. Of the 661 verses in the book of Mark, over 600 of them are found in Matthew and Luke. So they borrow a lot from Mark, but they also were apostles. They also have their own experiences they write as well. And they, they fill in a lot of details Mark leaves out. Now, Mark is the first gospel written. Think about this. He was the first one, Mark was, to put words about Jesus and his life on parchment. The first one to write this stuff down. Unlike the epistles or letters in the New Testament, the gospels don't tell us who the author is. And so church tradition tells us that. The early church fathers told us that a guy named John Mark was the writer of the book of Mark. John is actually his uh, um, Jewish name, and Mark is his Roman name, John Mark. Now, it might surprise you to know this, that John Mark is not the kind of guy you would expect to write a gospel, let alone the first gospel ever written. And here's why. John Mark was a quitter. He quit. A flake unfaithful, inconsistent, failed. Anybody ever failed Jesus, quit on Jesus? Anybody ever done that before? If you've ever done that, then you feel real comfortable with John Mark because that's what he did. The first church in Jerusalem met in John Mark's house. His mother, it was her house, and, he, and they met there, and he was just a young teenager at the time, and a young short teenager at the time, right? And and he was there, and he was meeting all the apostles and meeting the church leaders. He was learning about the church. And about 46 A.D., um, his cousin Barnabas comes into town with an up-and-coming leader called Paul, named Paul. And, and they, had, they brought a bunch of money to Jerusalem because they're going through a famine. And the church up in Antioch, which is modern-day Syria, the church up there collected a whole bunch of money and brought it down to Jerusalem to give to the Jewish Christians there in Jerusalem because they were going through a famine. And so Barnabas and Paul deliver this to them. And so John Mark already knew Barnabas, that was his cousin, but now he meets the apostle Paul. They were impressed with John Mark. They said, hey, why don't you come back with us to Antioch, which now was the epicenter of Christianity. It left Jerusalem, now was out in the uh, Antioch area. So the church was really growing up in the northern portion. And, and, and so they, they, they did. And so John Mark did, and he goes up, and he, he stays with them, and he's working there in the church of Antioch. And a few years later, about 49 A.D., they go on their first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas. And Barnabas had been mentoring Paul, because Paul was newer to the faith. And, and, and they go on this missionary journey, planting churches all throughout some of the areas of the Roman Empire. And they say, hey, John Mark, do you want to come with us? John Mark says, I'll go with you. He was still young. But somewhere on the missionary journey, John Mark, for some reason unknown to us, flakes out when they get to Perga. And he quits and deserts them, and he goes home. We don't know why. Maybe it was the demands of travel. 
the difficulty of the mission. We're not sure, but he goes back home and prefers the comforts of home. Well, a few years later, it's time for a second missionary journey to go see the churches they established in the first journey and also to establish some new churches. And Barnabas says, hey, Paul, as you go on our second journey, let's get John Mark to go with us again. And what does Paul say? Not at all. No way, he says. We're not going to have a deserter go with us on our second trip. Last time he quit on us, right? And it was such a heated argument between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas sided with John Mark. Hey, I want him to go on a trip with us. And Paul says, no way. He's a quitter, a flake. There's so much tension there, they split ways. And basically, Paul fired Barnabas, <laughs> his mentor. He fired him, picked up Silas, went the second missionary journey, and Barnabas went back and spent time with Mark. Mark was marked as a quitter, someone who is not faithful. If that is you today, if you'd say, you know what, I've made a lot of mistakes in my Christian life. I've made a lot of mistakes on this journey. I, I'm not sure I can follow Jesus. I want to tell you this. Following Jesus is for imperfect people. Following Jesus is for imperfect people. How many imperfect people do we have in here this morning? How many? See? All right, we got three. All right, the rest of you need to get up here and preach a sermon. Okay. Actually, the rest of you didn't raise your hand or are liars, so now you're imperfect. Let me tell you. All of you who raised your hands and those of you who didn't are all imperfect, and so you're qualified candidates for following Jesus. Isn't that good news? No perfect people allowed. Here's why no perfect people are allowed, because perfect people don't think they need Jesus. It's only those who've messed up. What happens? Well, Barnabas is spending time with Mark, not just for a week or a month, and not just a year, but for years, for a decade. He's spending time with Mark. Introduces him to Peter, who, by the way, knows a little bit about failure himself. And Peter begins to pour into John Mark for weeks, months, for years. And you know what, Peter? Here's some comments you see on the screen the comments you see that people make about John Mark 10 years, over 10 years after he had quitted, quit the mission. Peter says about him, he calls him my son. That's a pretty endearing term. He's my son. He was serving right alongside Peter for years. And, 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 and then the apostle Paul told the Colossians, hey, when John Mark is actually helping, when Paul was in prison for the first time, John Mark was there with him, helping him, ministering to him, and, and Paul says, hey, when John Mark goes to you in you Colossians, when he comes to you, he says, welcome him. Welcome him. He calls him a fellow worker in the ministry. So from a quitter, 10 years later, 10 years plus, now he is a fellow worker. Welcome him. He's a dear son of Peter. So much so when Paul's in prison a second time. And it's his last letter he ever wrote. He's about to die, about to be martyred. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, here's what Paul says about Mark. Paul's been abandoned by everyone, about to be martyred. And he says this in 2 Timothy 4, 11, Luke alone is with me. Everyone else is gone. And Luke, he tells Timothy, get Mark. Find him. Go get Mark, he says, and bring him with you. Why? For he is very, what does it say? Useful for me in the ministry. Very useful, he says, to me for ministry. The word means to be profitable, to do well. If you'd say today, I'm not, I can't follow Jesus, I make way too many mistakes, I, 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 am, I, am, I am way too far imperfect, let me tell you something, God can work in you. Jesus makes imperfect people useful. So wherever you are, wherever you come from, he'll take you from where you are, and he can make you useful for ministry. Is that good news to anybody today? 
no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how much you've deserted or quit the mission, that if you give your life to Jesus fully and go through a process what the Bible calls discipleship, a key theme in the book of Mark. John Mark, discipled by Barnabas, discipled by Peter. You let people invest in you, you can, God can use those people, and Jesus can make you useful. Man, Paul had changed his tune about John Mark. From he can't go on a triple dust, he's a quitter, to I got to have him by my side. I got to have him here. Today, God can do that with you. God chooses to use imperfect people for his mission. That's every one of us in this room. And John Mark was so excited about all that Jesus Christ had done for him, what he does is he writes it down in a book we call Mark. He tells Peter, Peter, has anybody written this stuff down? Because Peter's telling him story after story after story of being an apostle. And, and, and John Mark, hey, wait, wait, tell that story again. And he's writing this down. Wait, wait, tell me again what happened there, and he's writing this down. It really could be called the gospel of Peter, because <laughs> John Mark's only a ghostwriter, right? But he's writing down from Peter, learning firsthand about all that had happened. And he writes this thing we call the gospel of Mark. The Holy Spirit used his experience. The Holy Spirit used his passion. And he tells his story. The gospel of Mark is written in a very interesting way. It is fast moving. It is, it is action packed. It is, it is staccato in its approach. It's, it's quick moving. And it's, in fact, the, the adverb quickly or immediately or at once appears about 87 times in the New Testament. Half of those times are in one book, the book of Mark. At once, quickly, immediately, they left. It's a really quick-moving book. doesn't say a whole lot about what Jesus said. It says a whole lot about what Jesus did. Not so much the teaching of Jesus. Matthew does a lot of that. But Mark gives us really more of the life of Jesus. And so we're going to be looking at that here in the days to come. And Mark is going to confront us with Jesus. Confront us with Jesus. He's going to put Jesus Christ in front of us week after week after week in such a way where it's impossible to remain neutral about Jesus. He's going to force us to decide about Jesus. John Mark's going to put him in front of us so that Jesus Christ was going to slice humanity basically in half. As far as John Mark's concerned, there are only two people in the world, people who believe in Jesus and people who do not believe in Jesus. And Jesus Christ will make you choose because you cannot be neutral about Jesus. Years ago, before 183A was built here, uh, I was at a, a traffic light. And this is at the 620, 183 intersection. There was no toll road, and so traffic was terrible. It's still terrible today, but it's really terrible back then. It was just terrible traffic, and I was sitting there on 183, and it's, all this traffic was everywhere, and I hear a siren. I hear a fire truck, and I look in my rearview mirror, and a fire truck is coming up from behind, and I remember thinking, wow, this is not the best time for a fire truck to try to get through this crowd. And what was happening is I was watching, I was watching, it was working its way, and it was basically moving forward, and it wasn't going to the left, it wasn't going to the right, this fire truck was going right at the middle of 183, and everyone in front of that fire truck had to make a decision. I got to move to the right. Or I got to move to the left. Why? Because that fire truck was coming through. It was this fire truck that was being persistent and it was being perpetual and it was being pushy. <laughs> and it was coming through and you had to make a decision. And I was reminded of that. And I was thinking as I was watching my rearview mirror, it coming up and I finally had to make my own decision. And I remember thinking, that's just like Jesus coming up through 2,000 years of history, and you can see him coming, and when he gets to you, you got to make a decision. One thing you can't be about Jesus is neutral. you got to move to the right, move to the left, believe or don't believe, but you can't just say, I don't know. And Mark is going to make us make that decision. And even for those who claim to believe in him, he's going to challenge us to make sure we're following him. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? How do we follow him? What are the marks of following Jesus? There's three big things we're going to talk about here in the weeks to come. The first one is this, a new king. A new king. 
For the first three chapters, you see in the book of Mark, he's talking about a new king. A king is coming. Again, you can't be neutral about a king. When someone says, I'm your king, you can't go, okay, that's nice. When someone's your king, you either follow them or you don't follow them. And he is our new king, Mark says. And then, basically, Mark 3 through Mark 5, he's going to talk about a new kingdom. This new kingdom. New king, now a new kingdom. Hey, this is the new way I'm doing things now. Here's how we do things in my kingdom. And then Mark 6 through 8, when we talk about a new mission. Based on the new king and the new kingdom, I'm going to give you a new mission. Now, our church, we call this up, in, and out. Up, we worship the king. In, we actually live in the kingdom and we operate in the kingdom, but we also go out to the world on mission for him. And Mark's going to have that unfold as we walk through the gospel of Mark together on this path of discipleship that's costly. And the very guy who quit a decade earlier, as he's writing these words down, he, now he's persevering through difficulty and the cost of discipleship. So where does Mark begin? It's a good question. Where do you begin the Jesus story? Where do we begin this Jesus story? Well, Mark 1.1 1, 1 says the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. The beginning, he says, of the good news. He, he hearkens back to the beginning. He, and and it, it kind of reminds you of Genesis 1.1, where in the beginning God created everything, where God stepped into time and made a physical creation. Now a new beginning is happening, but, and it's not physical now. He's making a spiritual creation. God's doing something new. For a world that hungers and a world that's in need, God comes in and says, you know what, I'm going to, do something about brokenness and about dysfunction and about sin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come make a new creation. I'm going to come and reverse the curse. God begins to work, and that word beginning is a very interesting word. That word beginning has this idea of not just temporal, as in you initiate something, but it has the idea of something that's being foundational. You build upon it. What is what 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 was what was beginning with, 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 with when Jesus came? What was what was being built upon? It's good news. At the very beginning, what's foundational, at the very beginning, he says, is this good news? And so that's where you begin. You begin with good news. We have so much bad news in our world. It's good to have some good news. And Mark begins in the very first chapter, the very first verse says, here's the beginning, here's the foundation of it all. Here's where it all starts, he says, with good news news. That word good news was an interesting word in that day and time. It was a secular word, actually. It wasn't even a spiritual word. It was what you would use to announce something about a king. A king was born, or a king was going to arrive, or a king had a military victory. And you would pronounce the good news of the king. And the early church took this secular word and reinvented it for Jesus. Jesus the king was born. Jesus the king is arriving. Jesus the king is giving us victory. That is the good news he's talking about here. I love that Mark begins with that. I mean, there's no Christmas with Mark, right? <laughs> right? You read Matthew and Luke, they have like nativity stories. Mark doesn't even begin with that. He begins with good news. That's where he's going to start running from. No long genealogy like you have in Matthew. You can't pronounce half the words, right? No, no two chapters of birth stories like Luke has. No 18-verse prologue of the pre-incarnate Christ like John has. Mark steps in and goes, you know what? I'm going to run. With, it gets a, it's a fast-moving book. I'm going to cut the chase. We're going to talk about good news. What is the good news? Well, it's, it's the best of news, he says. The gods are no longer going to put up with, no longer put up with dysfunction and, and darkness and, and, and a damaged, deceived world. God's going to in, intervene and do something. That phrase, good news, was a, was a word that the Anglo-Saxon word was God's spell. We get the word gospel from it. It's the gospel. It's the good news. Today we're going to ask three questions. Three questions as we need to ask here at the beginning. And here's the first one. That is, what is the good news? What is the good news here he says, he says the, at the beginning there's good news, he says. What is the good news? Well, back to Mark 1.1, 1, 1, he says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. 
So the good news, first of all, is that we have Jesus, a person who is a Savior for us. That's the very first thing he talks about. The word Jesus was a common word that day and time. And you don't, may not realize that, but in the Jewish world, in the first century, there, there were a lot of Jesuses running around, right? A lot of them. It was, it was a very common name because it was based off the Hebrew name, Yahushua, Joshua. It meant Yahweh saved or Yahweh is salvation. Everybody wanted to name their kid that. So there's a whole lot of Jesuses running around. But this one would be different. He really would be a savior. He really would save the world from, it, from sin. As the angel told Joseph in Matthew 1, 21, she'll give birth to a son, you'll give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus, a person right, who is a savior for us. We have this savior that's come to us. His name is Jesus, a real historical person. Go back to Mark 1, 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So now he, here he's talking about Messiah, a king who is Lord over us. A king who is Lord over us. Jesus is a person who is Savior for us, but, but now we have Messiah who is a king who is Lord over us. See, the Messiah was the idea of this king who was coming. The Old Testament talked about it well, that David was a, the greatest king of the Old Testament. They said, hey, a guy's going to come one day just like David, but his kingdom will be eternal. His kingdom will, kingdom will go on and on. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus Christ. Messiah, Christ, they mean the same thing, anointed one. Christ is not his last name, right? Jesus, first name, last name, Christ. No, no, that's not how it works. Jesus was his name. Christ was his title. Jesus is his name. Messiah is his title. He is Jesus, who is the Christ, who is the Messiah. Promised in the Old Testament. We see it in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Talking about the coming Messiah. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. It will go on and on. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forward. Where you have Messiah, you have peace, you have justice, you have righteousness, and it goes on forever. That's what the Old Testament prophets talked about. And what Mark is saying, Jesus is this person. Jesus is him. He has come now. He is Jesus. He is Savior for us, but he's also, he's also Messiah, his king, and his Lord over us as well. And then back to Mark 1, 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Here you have the Son of God, a Son who is God with us. Son of God, a Son who is God with us. Not just is he a person who is Savior for us or a king who is Lord over us, but he's a son of God, a son who is God with us. It's one thing to have Jesus, who's a savior, another thing to have a king, actually, who's Lord over us, but now we have this, this God who came down to us. The Romans knew all about gods. They didn't really care about the Messiah. That was a Jewish thing, but, but the Romans knew about gods, they had all kinds of gods, and Mark says, this is the real God, this is the real one. He has the very spiritual DNA of God. This was, a, this was a, an explicit reference to the deity of Jesus. Son of God was an idiom that meant he was God himself. So now, not only do we have this, this, this Savior for us and this, this Lord over us, but we have this, this God who's now living with us. As the angel had told Joseph, Back in Matthew 1 again, Matthew 1, 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and that will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So that's the good news. The good news is God didn't give us a principle or perspective to live by. He gave us a person who would be a savior for us. God didn't give us some kind of moral code to follow. He gave us a Messiah, a king who would be Lord over us. 
And the greatest gift God gave us was the gift of himself. It was God with us. If you want to know what God is like, you just look at Jesus. Everyone else has to wonder, what is God like? We're the only belief system on the planet that believes our God actually came down and lived with us. As a Savior, as a Lord, as God himself living with us. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, Messiah, the Son of God. That statement is how the whole thing begins. First chapter, first verse, that's a summary statement of the entire book. It is good news. Just 14 words in English, seven words in Greek. Very quick, but it is powerful. It will divide every one of two groups of people. If you believe this, it will change your hopes, your dreams. It will change your life, your lifestyle, your habits as you let this new king and his new kingdom give you a new mission. Savior for you, Lord over you, God with you. It's good news. It's wonderful news. And with the quickness of the book of Mark, he, he rushes straight from this kind of opening statement to the Jordan River, and he begins introducing us to John the Baptizer, or John the Baptist. We're going to read about him, then we'll, be clo we'll close up. We'll get to Jesus next week. But John is coming before Jesus, introducing us to Jesus, announcing his coming. John the Baptizer, they call him that because he was baptizing people. And here John the Baptist is actually someone who is a relative of Jesus. On his mother's side, Mary had a relative named Elizabeth, and her son was John. And he doesn't talk at all here, Mark, about his, uh, John's parents like Luke does, or his miraculous birth. And he just talks really about the idea that he was come and announcing. Again, Mark's audience is Romans, and Romans knew about this. When the king comes, someone announces before the king ever shows up, and John the baptizer is that person announcing the king's arrival. And to do so, he quotes some Old Testament passages out of the scripture here. In Mark chapter 1, verse 2, he says, as it is written, as it is written, and John is speaking, he says, uh, as it is written, the, the prophet, I, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. I'm sorry, Mark is speaking. Mark is speaking, talking about John the baptizer how he is going to be this messenger going before Jesus, preparing the way for him. Now it says Isaiah here, really he's quoting Malachi. Malachi 3.1, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. You say, well, if he's quoting Malachi, then why does he say Isaiah? Because in the very next verse, he actually does quote Isaiah. Very, a very common thing. They, they take all these unrelated verses, put them together, and put one common name over them. That's how they kind of did that in the Jewish world that day and time. Verse 3 is when he goes into Isaiah's passage after the preamble of Malachi. A voice of one calling the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Again, that's Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice of one calling the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He commands them to prepare a way, commands them to, to make the road straight. But what is he talking about there? The next verse gives more clarity, verse 4. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain shall be made low, the rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. And so what you have here is you have, uh, where there's a valley, you raise the valley up, where there's a, a high spot, you, you make it low, where it's not, where it's rough, you level it out and make, these, make places plain. See, this is a, a day and time before paved roads. Or even in our day and time, if you go to a third world country, every time we go to Haiti, every time we go to India, every time we go to Africa, we experience this, right? I mean, you might have to go 30 miles, but it takes you four hours to get there, right? Because there are potholes and everything else. And, and what they would do in this day and time, when a king was coming, they would announce it, not just days, but sometimes weeks and months in advance. The king is coming, and the people of the cities would go, and they would, they would fill in the potholes and level out the high points and clean up debris and get all the obstacles out of the way so it was unencumbered whenever he came into town. And that's what he's saying here. He says, hey, a king is coming. That was the message of John the Baptist. He was supposed to tell people, a king is coming. Prepare the way for him. 
make things straight. We understand this, right? Somebody important come into your house, what do you do? <laughs> you know, it could be like somebody you don't really care about, you know, I mean, you know, whatever, or a good friend, like a neighbor or a friend. You don't have to worry about it. But somebody real important, like you want to make a good impression, what do you do? You make things straight, right? You throw things in the closet, right? You're cleaning everything up. Hey, when royalty shows up, you make things straight. That's what John the Baptist was saying. The king is coming. Are you preparing your life? Are you making things straight? Are you ready for him to arrive? Are you opening the way for him to come into your life? That was the role of John the baptizer, to come before Jesus, to make things straight, to prepare the highway for people to meet Jesus. That was his task. Prepare the way. You know, John the baptizer seems to appear out of the blue, but it's not really out of the blue. <laughs> it's based on a blueprint. All these prophecies tell us that, that, that Mark's weaving together that God had this plan from a long time ago. That Jesus would come, and now the, John the baptizer is announcing his coming. Verse 4, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So here you have John the Baptist, he's preaching in, in the wilderness. A desert place. I mean, it means desert, not our idea of trees. It really means more of a barren desert existence. In the Bible, it's always a place of testing, a place of salvation. Somewhere between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea was this Judean area of desert and wilderness. Some of the hottest places in the globe are right there, and that's where John is. He appeared there. Now, he didn't really appear there like you're thinking and I'm thinking. He'd been there a long time. Luke tells us that his aging parents passed on and he was raised in that area, probably in, in the, the Qumran community or the Essenines raised him and he's kind of a monastic out there, living out in the desert. Been there for a long time, but for 400 years no prophet had spoken. And so in a way he did appear because for 400 years he'd been quiet and now John begins to speak, the voice, the prophet appears and begins speaking out and telling people the Messiah is coming. The last prophet said he was coming. Now he says, I'm telling you, he's about to be here. He's preparing the way for the Messiah. Matthew 3, 1 gives a little more content here. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent. The kingdom is near. The, the new kingdom is coming. New king is coming. New kingdom is coming. New mission. Get things right. It, it was a rough message. Repent was the message. In fact, when Luke writes about it, in his gospel, Luke 3, 7, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, he says, you brood of vipers. <laughs> That's not very seeker sensitive right there. Eh? Hey, everyone, did you hear what he said? He called us a bunch of vipers. Let's invite our friends next week. They can come with us. Are we streaming this? Jerusalem needs to hear this. Let's hear this. Let's hear this. It's wonderful things. All right, I mean, it was, now you would think they'd be offended by this, and to some degree they were. But in verse 8 he says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Hey, if you're really repentant, you, there should be fruit in your life. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. See, these are Jewish people who are proud. They have their law, they have their religion, they, they're descendants of Abraham, and they, they, were, you know, they were faithful churchgoers. They had done everything right, and they were going, why are you telling us to repent? And why do we have to get baptized? Now, don't get confused. This is not Christian baptism. This is before Christian baptism. But it was a form of ceremonial washing, a type of baptism they were doing. If you're a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, you want to become Jewish, you had to get circumcised, obey the law. But what, another thing you had to do is you had to get baptized, kind of a ceremonial washing. That's kind of what's happening here. But it wasn't just Gentiles he was baptizing. It was even Jewish people. They go, wait a minute. We have to baptize Gentiles because they're defiled, they're unclean. Why are you baptizing us? Are you saying that we're defiled and we're unclean? It was kind of an offensive message. He says, why are you doing this with us, he's saying. But here's the thing. When you read Luke's account, there were Jewish people there, there were tax collectors there, there were Roman soldiers there. It's a collector group of people who were just coming around. They were getting baptized. 
They, they, were, they, were, they were hungering for this. In fact, in Luke 3.10 it says, What should we do then, they asked. They weren't offended by him saying, Hey, you guys, I can make these stones in this desert worship God. It, it's not a matter of getting of being a son of Abraham or obeying the law. It's a matter of, of the heart. And so we're asking three questions today. The first question is, what is the good news? But the second question is, how do I get this good news? And John tells them there. We just saw that in, in Mark 1, 4. He says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching the baptism of repentance and for the forgiveness of sins, the whole Judean hillside. And all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, there's some exaggeration used here, right? Some hyperbole. I mean, he says, a whole Judean hillside, all the people of Jerusalem. I doubt Jerusalem was empty. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't the entire hillside. But this is a way of saying a lot of people were there. And they were drawn. The, the language here in the Greek has the idea of a continual flow of people coming and getting baptized. He was attracting so much attention, John the Baptist was. Josephus, the historian, the secular historian, recorded this and said about how John the Baptist was out there and all these people were flocking to him, hearing this message and being baptized by him. The Jordan River was on the eastern boundary of Israel. It was about 20 miles from Jerusalem. Don't think they were just kind of walking outside the city and getting baptized, and they didn't have cars. People are flocking out of Jerusalem, walking over 20 miles through a desert with no water to be told they're a bunch of vipers. Why? Because there was something real about this message. They were drawn to it. Make no mistake about it, there's a lot being said here. They were outside of Jerusalem, outside the religious system. Here's the religious system. They were out of that. They left the religious system. They left the temple. They left the religious leaders, and they went out to the wilderness to a very difficult place, a place of testing and a place of salvation to say, you know what, I want a different life. You might be a church member. You might have been in church your whole life. You might have been, I, don't know, I don't know what your story is. Let me tell you something, it's not about this. It's not about the externals of the faith. It's about the heart. And they left all that external stuff. They were drawn to a message about our hearts being different. Are you ready for Jesus, he was telling. It was a sting indictment on the externalism of their faith. And they left all that, and they were going, and they were those four words you see on the screen, they were repenting and they were, there was confessing and there was forgiveness and there was baptism happening. So how do you receive this good news? First of all, I receive the good news when I admit my sin. Those four highlighted words, one of those words was confession. What does confession mean? It means I admit my sin. More specifically, to confess means to agree. It literally means to say the same thing. I say the same thing about myself that God says about me. I say the same thing about my sin that God says about my sin. I don't defend myself, defend who I am, defend what I've done. I say, God, whatever you say, I agree with you. I'm going to say the same thing you say. That's confession. And it's even a, an intensive form of the word. It means to speak out. They were confessing out loud. <laughs> Have you done that? Have you confessed out loud, not to a priest, but to Jesus? God, I agree with what you say about me. We know what good news is. It's about a Savior. It's about a Lord. It's, it's about a God who's come to us. But now, how do you receive the good news? You receive the good news, first of all, by admitting, by this idea of confession. Secondly, I turn to God, turn to God and from my sin. That's repentance. Another word you saw on the screen while ago is repentance. He had this message of repentance. We always think repentance is a negative thing, but it's meant to be a positive thing. The negative part is I turn from my sin, right? Here's my sin. I turn from that. But the positive part is I turn to God from sin. That's what it means a 180 degree turn, a change of mind. I agree with God about my sin. I confess. I also turn from my sin and myself. I turn 
to God. Like 1 Thessalonians 1.9 says, says, you turn to God from idols. That's the repentance. You turn to God from sin. Have you done that? As John told them, produce the fruit of repentance. What is that? It's a change of life, fruit, a change of life. I turn from sin, but I turn to God. I agree with God. I begin turning. I begin following him. And when I confess and when I repent, it says, you do this, he says, for the forgiveness of sin. You do this, and as a result, there will be forgiveness of sin. Then I experience salvation. So if you've never done that, that's how you experience salvation. God, I agree with you. What you say about me? And I turn from this, and I turn to you. Confession, repentance, and I experience the very forgiveness of God, which is salvation. And that's when you're baptized in the Christian faith. That's when we have a baptism. After confession and repentance, there's a sense of forgiveness. Have you done that? The word forgive means to send away, to release. Some of you today walked in here, you're watching online, you have a heavy burden on your shoulders. You need to release it. Agree with God. Turn from that. Turn to him and just release it. Experience your Savior. The story goes on. We wrap up here by just talking about John in the last few verses. It says in verse 6, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey unlike most Baptists he did not eat fried chicken he ate, he ate locusts wow that was common believe it or not that was not the Old Testament law read Leviticus sometime it talks about eating locusts it was a clean animal they would actually roast it believe it or not of course he also would baptize it in honey that's the only way to eat locusts right that's the only way to do it He ate what was available to him. Unlike the priests who had these royal rich robes, he's had camel, camel skin garment. I mean, you're, camel skin is rough. It's not, you don't make stuffed animals out of camel skin. It's, it's, it's not fluffy. It's not pleasant. It's rough. And again, we're seeing here, why, we talk, why is he talking about the wardrobe and the vegan diet? What's all this about? What he's talking about here is the idea that John was different. He was set apart from the religious leaders. He was very different. Today, you might say, I want to be different. I'm ready to leave the externalism of moralism, trying to do everything right. Leave the externalism of consumerism where it's all about me, all about what I get, and say, I want to follow different path that will fill me a savior who's for me right? a lord who's over me a god who is with me that's good news and through confession and repentance i receive that forgiveness i want to live a different life and john was trying to show them the way to actually do this verse 7 he says and this was his message here's what he told people after me comes one more powerful than i now he's talking about jesus the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. You might think I'm powerful. All you are flocking to me. You're leaving Jerusalem, coming to me. I have a big crowd in front of me. But it's not about me, he says. It's about him. He could have competitive rivalry with his relative Jesus, but he didn't. He was okay. He was okay. He said, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. The lowest servant in the house, and that, the roads were all dirty and dusty, and so you walk into a house, a servant would come and take off your sandals and wash your feet. The lowest servant would do that. And John says, I'm not even worthy to be a lowest servant when it comes to Jesus. In John 3, verse 30, he says, John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must decrease. The context here is everybody was leaving John to follow Jesus. All the group masses around him were leaving his big church to follow Jesus. And John says, that's all right, I'm not worried about it. I, he says, have to decrease so he can actually increase. And the last verse here is verse 8. I baptize you with water, John says, but he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
Mine's external, his is internal. Mine is physical, his is spiritual. With mine, you enter water. With his, the spirit enters you. Mine's a symbol of salvation. His is evidence of salvation. Mine is preparation for salvation. His is the fulfillment of salvation. Mine is temporary. His is eternal. It's very different, he says. These muddy waters of the Jordan don't save you. What will save you, he says, is infusion of the Holy Spirit. He said, whenever you forgive, whenever you confess and you repent, you receive that forgiveness, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. And there's, Old Testament talked about that, that the coming Messiah would come, and the coming Messiah, he would actually bring the gift of the Holy Spirit with him, and he's talking about that to them. The good news is about Jesus, not me. That's what John's saying. The good news is about Jesus, not me. I'm not worthy, he says. What I offer is incomplete, but he will fill you with the Spirit. And our lives must point to our good news, not our best self. Our lives must point to our good news, not our best self. If we're going to walk down this road being followers of Christ, we have to realize it's not about me, it's about Jesus. It's not about my best self, being the best person I can be. No, it's simply about the good news of Jesus. He forgives. All I have to do is confess and repent, follow him. He forgives and gives me new life. The three questions today are, what is the good news, and how do I get this good news, and when did my good news begin? What's the good news? Savior for me, right? a Lord over me, a God with me. How do I get it? Through confession and repentance, I receive forgiveness, the spirit that fills me. When did my good news begin? That's the question I ask you today. When did you start following Jesus? Or here's another way to ask the question is, when did Jesus become real to me? When did Jesus become real to me? That's when your good news began. Confession, repentance, forgiveness become real to you. I can't just claim a title. I'm a Christian. I have to have a testimony. I met Jesus. Don't just say, I'm a Christian. I was born in the church. I've always known God. I've always known God. When did you meet Jesus? How long has he been real to you? That's the question. Are you ready for good news? Are you ready to follow him? That's the journey we're we'll going to be on here in the weeks ahead. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this wonderful message. Lord, I, I pray for each one who's here today that they would say that they would know when their good news began. Those watching online and those who are here gathered, Father, they would know that. If they were here today and say, you know what, I'm not sure when I had this good news begin for me. I'm not sure when it really happened for me, but I want that. Then right now, in this service, at this moment, in this time, in their seats, or watching online, all they have to say is, they just confess their sin and repent from it and turn to God. Wherever you are, confess your sin. God, I am a sinner. And I leave that behind. I turn to you and ask for you to forgive me. And he will do that for you on this day, in this moment. You won't just have a title. You have a testimony that you met Jesus. We thank you for the good news, Lord. We have a Savior, we have a Lord, we have a God. We thank you for confession and forgiveness. I mean, confession and repentance that leads to forgiveness. God, I pray that every one of us would daily confess, daily repent. The first time we do it, we become Christ's followers, but every day after that, we continue doing that. It's part of following Jesus. And it would be good news. Not about us, but about him. More, Lord, may this message unsettle us. It's not about us, it's about you. It's not about our agenda, but yours. May we follow you. We end the service by worshiping you because you have done great things. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you for being our king, and you have done great things. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We have a prayer room back here.
care room, if you want to talk to someone about your faith, questions about being a follower of Christ, go back here during this last song. We stand up, let's worship God together.